everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong and welcome to this inaugural episode of Cracking Addiction with Dr. Tilipan Naren. Tilipan, how are you? I'm well, Fergal. How are you? I'm good. So we're going to be co-hosting this show and it's called Cracking Addiction. So what is this podcast video cast show about? What are we, what are we about? Well, what we're about or what we're going to try and be about is to hopefully educate, entertain and inform our viewers and listeners about addiction medicine. It's a fascinating field of medicine and addiction's a fascinating part of life. And we hope to demystify and hopefully educate people about addiction and hopefully share our journey along the way of educating ourselves, but also the population mm-hmm. about addiction. I think that's what our goal is anyway. Would you agree, Fergal? I couldn't have put it better myself. And I'm, I have to say, I'm so pleased to have a colleague with me who's equally as passionate about the subject of addiction medicine and also passionate about you know, the idea of getting messages out to the general public, to audiences, to the medical profession, etc. So it's great to have you on board as a co-host of Cracking Addiction. Um, I was actually thinking about, you know, how we were going to approach this. And I suppose the first question that I wanted to ask you was, why is why do you find addiction medicine fascinating? Why are you in this space? I think I initially fell into this space. If you'd asked me about four or five years ago if I would be doing addiction medicine or any form of addiction medicine, I I would have laughed at you. I I encountered patients with addiction issues in my uh, previous life. So for our listeners and viewers, I'm a general practitioner, but I'm also currently doing addiction medicine advanced training through the College of Physicians. But when I saw patients with substance use disorder, I was very scared. I was very nervous. I used to think my buttons were being pushed and I was being forced to behave or do things that were outside my comfort zone. And then I manifested that as uh, as anxiety, as aggression. And sometimes I'm embarrassed to say I probably didn't treat people as well as they deserve to be treated. But the more you do of anything, um, the more you come to realize the nuances and subtleties of addiction. And a lot of the patients and people that we see with addiction are people dealing with, with trauma, with great hurt, emotional upset. And trying to treat people holistically in a non-judgmental fashion, as you would any other patient, as you would any other human being, reaps great benefits. And I've seen the biggest improvements in people's health in addiction medicine. It is a very rewarding field of medicine, and it's something which I find intriguing, interesting, and enthralling, and something that I'm hoping to dedicate my life to. And I guess uh, to put it back to you, Fergal, uh, what what piqued your interest in addiction, and and why you why did you elect to co-host this podcast with me? <laughs> so I just want to reflect on what you just said. I mean, what I hearing what I'm hearing from you is that people with addictions are the most vulnerable in society, and yet they respond so well to treatment. Right? Agreed. So I, I I didn't realize this when I when I first graduated as a general practitioner in the United Kingdom, you know, I, I was, as you say, one of those GPs who didn't want to do addiction medicine, didn't want to treat that kind of patient. And, you know, a friend of mine came up to me one day and said, hey, Fergal, do you want to do some free training? I said, yeah, sure, let's do some free training. What's it about? And he said, addiction medicine. I said, okay, well, I'll do the training because I love training, but I won't see any patients because I, I, I worked in a surgery at the time that... And the overriding principle was we don't look after that kind of people, those kind of people. So I did the training and then I had to do a minimum number of clinical hours as part of that training. And as a result of that, I actually fell in love with the subject because, as you say, it's fascinating. The pharmacology of addiction, the neurobiology of addiction, the sociology of addiction, it's all fascinating. And then, you know, you get to meet people, you know, and nobody wakes up. One day says, you know what, as a career choice, I'm going to become a drug addict. There's always a reason. And I don't ask why the addiction, I ask why the pain. You know, because as you've said, trauma is a big driver for addiction. And I'll never forget the very first person I ever started on buprenorphine. And, you know, I had, I was very lucky, I had a hole in one. I just finished my training. I got a little kind of side hustle job working in a, in a criminal justice funded service and a mother brings her son in and says, oh, doctor, I'll pay you privately. I'll pay you more so long as you look after my son, because if he doesn't get off heroin, he's going to prison. So I said, look, I'll do my best for him. No problem. 
You don't need to pay me privately. But let me do let me do my best for him. And I started him on buprenorphine. He was the first patient I ever did start on buprenorphine. And within three days, he'd stopped using heroin. Within two, three weeks, he'd moved back home to his parents. Within three months, he was working for cash in hand in his father's business. By six months, he was paying taxes. And I was able to witness that transition from someone who was hovering around going to prison to someone who had reintegrated back into society, back into his family, and was paying taxes just because I'd started him on this wonder drug, buprenorphine. And I thought to myself, well, why doesn't everyone do this? This is so easy. <laughs> Little did I know, but still, that success, that success, that early success has spurred me to continue my career in addiction medicine. And just as you're embarking upon your training to become an addiction medicine specialist, I did that training, uh, you know, I completed that last year. And I find that, that educational journey completely fascinating and utterly rewarding. So that's, that's my story. And I think our stories, Virgil, reflect something that's quite deep in that medicine sometimes is a illness treatment paradigm. But sometimes mm. when we look beyond that to the social determinants of health, why is someone yeah. behaving in such a manner? What can I do? Acting more like, dare I say it, and I don't want to be too blasé or trite, but acting like humans to fellow humans and trying to find that connection, that's usually where I feel we, we get the best response with our patients. When you see the human being behind all of this quote-unquote problem behaviour, uh, and yeah. trying to address the behaviors or the hurt or the trauma, then I find most of the issues go away. And hopefully through this podcast, we'll probably give a bit of advice on medication and medication management. But a lot of the time in addiction medicine, I feel we're trying to find pill-based solutions for non-pill-based problems. And hopefully we'll give exactly. tools to practitioners about some of these non-pill-based treatments that we can give our patients and try and treat people in, in, in a holistic manner. Would you, would you say that's fair? Oh, absolutely. I mean, what I'm hearing is, 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 is just music to my ears. So I, I believe that human empathy goes a long way in, uh, in any interaction and especially in the clinical interaction. And, and I just want to pick up a point that you made earlier and that, I, that hopefully I've also demonstrated in my story that both of us, when we were starting out in our, in our early postgraduate years, we didn't want to see these people. We were frightened of these patients. Yes. You know, we, they, they were somebody else's problem. And this is what I say now to my students. Uh, you know, I don't get as many problems with people who are drug affected or people who have got dependency issues compared to people without. So in my surgery, I defy anyone to come to visit my surgery and see in the waiting room, and I'll say to them, spot the person with a substance use disorder. And since I've moved to Australia, I've had to uh, end or terminate a therapeutic relationship with a patient three times. None of them have been with someone who had a substance use disorder. One little old lady physically and verbally attacked me because I reported her to the driver vehicle licensing authorities because she couldn't drive. Another woman threatened me with legal action because I refused to countenance putting a peg tube into her, into her dying mother. And uh, the third gentleman um, basically was, you know, he just swore at me when I wouldn't give him um, some, uh, I think it was um, antibiotics for uh, a sore throat. You know, so none of those patients had substance use disorder. And yet we're all frightened about that. Can, do you, can you, have you ever thought about why doctors feel fear when they're confronted with these issues? I think a lot of fear is fear of the unknown. And mm. in with addiction, a, a lot of us maybe don't recognize addiction appropriately. And sometimes mm. we see patients who are quite desperate and desperation mm. and anxiety can breed fear. I think, I think desperation and anxiety yeah. are contagious. If you see a yeah. patient who's fidgeting, who's anxious, sometimes agitated, that could actually be help-seeking behavior. They've come to see you. Yeah. That's yeah. that's a positive step in my book. Can I help yeah. alleviate this agitation? But sometimes, mm -hmm. instead of asking a few more questions, when we say, no, sorry, I don't do that, uh, please leave, 
that's not really helping yeah. the person. That's not really assisting in the problem. And that's potentially amping up a situation. And I think another yeah. issue potentially is no one likes conflict. I hate conflict. I'm, I'm an, I like to think I'm an agreeable person. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes with addiction medicine and sometimes when dealing with some of our patients, as, with, as we would with any patient, there needs to be boundaries and there needs to be rules and guidelines followed. When I see someone with hypertension, I follow the therapeutic guidelines. And if a patient yeah. were to ask me to increase their medication, I would have to have a good reason to increase their medication because there are consequences of over-treating someone with high blood pressure. Similarly, with opioid medication or other medications of dependence or addiction, I will absolutely listen to what a patient has to tell me, but I have to be convinced that I'm practicing or prescribing in a safe manner. And just like I would put boundaries in place with most of my patients with regards to therapies, no different with addiction. And sometimes being upfront, standing up for what you believe in, but always providing a reason and excuse. And it's never with me telling a patient that they're, say, quote, a bad patient, unquote. No, it's about the medication, medication safety, and having someone's best interests uh, in, in, yeah. in heart and in mind. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that chimes with my experience. You know, it's, it's absolutely vital to maintain medication safety, but within that space, you have to fill that space with human empathy and understanding. So you can't practice medicine safely without boundaries, but you do need to practice medicine with human empathy, and the two can coexist. I mean, I, I have previously been accused of not caring for patients when I've put boundaries in place. I mean, I'll never forget the time I was told that I didn't care when I tried to reduce uh, a lady off her fentanyl patch. So this is a lady that, come, that had come and seen me uh, on a Friday afternoon, uh, you know, when I was doing a GP locum, and she, and she came in and she said those words which I dread. Oh, doctor, hello, I'm just here for my quick script. I said, all right, madam, you know, what, what quick script is that? I said, oh, yes, my fentanyl 50 microgram patch. And for those who aren't medically trained, that's a very potent opioid at a very high dose. I said, oh, why do you need it? Because it's normally used for cancer. Oh, I've got this chronic elbow pain and I work as a hairdresser. So it's the only thing that keeps me working and it's coming up to Christmas and I'm really busy and I need my fentanyl. So, you know, there are ACGP and various other organizations specifically mandates against the use of fentanyl for chronic non-cancer pain. And this lady had chronic, she didn't have cancer, so therefore it was chronic non-cancer pain and it certainly wasn't diagnosed. You know, I just referred to it as the hairdresser's elbow. And, you know, I, there was absolutely no way that I could give her a full 50 microgram patch. So I, I reduced her down to the next level and said, well, come and see, go and see your regular doctor in a couple of weeks to continue the reduction. So that doctor, there, her regular doctor, when he found out about it, came and accused me of not caring. And he put her straight back up to 50. You know, so it's it, it can be somewhat socially or professionally isolating if you are trying to practice safe medicine. But... You know, you know, a couple of weeks after that, I was able to uh, do a talk on prescription opioid safety and that same doctor was in the audience. So I think he got the message that actually uh, we, we do have to be safe as well as care for our patients and, and being safe is caring for our patients. Have you had any experiences of where, where, where boundaries have become an issue for you? Absolutely. And for some of our hopeful medical listeners, uh, the inherited patient or someone who had seen another GP who, uh, through retirement or any restrictions being placed on their registration, needs to find a new doctor to prescribe their medications of dependence, uh, has certainly come and seen me. I think most GPs would probably be familiar with this scenario. And it is quite stressful and anxiety provoking because automatically you're pushed out of your comfort zone because usually a lot of these patients are on high doses of medications that most of us would not be comfortable prescribing in unsafe combinations and usually in quantities that we wouldn't be prescribing as well. So like you say, Fergal, in these scenarios, what I try and do is I try and listen to the patient. I'm a big believer in doing a physical examination where possible. Usually there's a pain component to this. So if it's back pain or elbow pain or neck pain, I try and examine the joint. And I think this serves two purposes. One, it shows that I'm listening to what the patient's saying. Two, I'm a big believer in the laying on of hands, so to speak. Uh, it, mm. it shows that you're listening to what the patient's saying and that you're taking their concerns seriously. And then after I've done the examination, I usually try and come up with an arrangement or agreement with the patient. 
like you, I refer back to the RACGP and pain faculty guidelines about, for example, opioid medications in chronic non-cancer pain. And for our listeners out there, and we'll explore this in future episodes, there is no evidence, nor is there a role for opioids in in chronic non-cancer related pain. And then obviously you can't just stop medications immediately cold turkey. The patient will probably go through a very unpleasant withdrawal. But I usually set up a treatment paradigm and I give patients options, whether it's weaning, rotating opioids, or if they're dependent or addicted, considering opioid substitution therapy. And I like I like giving patients choices in, in, in the treatment um, program as we would with any medical condition. It's never my way or the highway with in medicine. It, it's usually about collaborative care, patient-centered care, and addiction medicine is no different. However, it is always important in these encounters to practice safely and not prescribe medications you feel unsafe prescribing or quantities of medications you feel unsafe um, prescribing. Ultimately, we are in charge of what we prescribe. No one else is in charge of what we prescribe, but we can be sensible without being heartless and we need to prescribe in an appropriate manner uh, to, to ensure that we are still able to continue to prescribe for all of our patients. Would that, would that be fair, Fergal? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, this goes back to the concept of boundaries and what, what, uh, what we feel comfortable with. Now, here's an interesting point that I think is important for everyone to understand. I've had patients come to me and say, look, doctor, my specialist says I need these medications. Therefore, you as the GP has to prescribe them. He who signs the prescription bears the medical legal responsibility for that prescription. So even as a specialist, when you write to a a GP and say, please prescribe X, Y, and Z, if the GP agrees to it, the GP is taking on the responsibility. So if you're, you know, from the context of, or from the perspective of general practice, when we write prescriptions, it's our neck on the chopping block, no one else's. So it's not enough for us to rely on the borrowed authority or the borrowed support of a specialist when we are prescribing medication, all medication, but in particular medication that has risk attached to it. So we have to be sure that we are happy to do that prescription. And, you know, this, you've touched on the, on the issue of chronic lung cancer pain and opioid stewardship. I mean, I think it's important to understand when we both started medicine, we, we, we both had the attitude, oh, we don't look after that, that kind of person. We don't look after people with drug issues. Prescription opioid use prescription, or chronic opioid use, prescription opioid misuse, and prescription opioid use disorder is so prevalent. I mean, it's roughly about 4% of all Australians have misused, uh, misused a, a pharmaceutical in the last 12 months. So it's really untenable to take the position that, you know, if you're in a surgery that you don't look after people who have got uh, dependency issues. I don't know what your experience is of, of dealing with, you know, the hidden dependency of prescription opioid use is. It's something that is eye-opening, and amidst all this yeah. doom and gloom that we're we're saying at this point in time, and amidst all the stressors we've just said, it is a very rewarding feel. Most patients yeah. are seeking help, and it is something where the help is readily available and the treatment is easily prescribed. So yeah. throughout this podcast um, and through the journey that we're going to take you on, dear listener and viewer, we will fit you mm. with the tools to treat patients with addiction and substance use disorder empathetically, humanely, safely, and with the latest evidence-based treatments. So yeah. this is a condition where the cure and the treatment is readily available, and we hope to provide you with the information and tools to do so. So I couldn't have said it better myself. I really look forward to working with you as we go forward on cracking addiction. Same here, Fergal. And thank you, dear listeners, viewers, for for enjoying this inaugural episode of Cracking Addiction. Please remember to, to like and subscribe this podcast.